Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 89, the first episode of 2014. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And today's January 13th, 2014. Welcome to the first episode of 2014 for Kevin and George and the crew. You guys are looking at your watch and you're saying, yeah, well, it's January 13th. Where have you guys been for three weeks? Well, George is a clergy guy. He has um, responsibilities beyond reason during Christmas, and uh, I got the flu. In fact, everybody in my family got the flu, and that wiped us out. We did actually have a, 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 a chance last week to sit down and tape. And it was either uh, a sugar uh, issue or molasses issue or there's poisoned egg dye because George and I sat down, we turned on our cameras and it's like, hi, George. <laughs> hi, Kevin. There's it's just no either, energy. <laughs> it's either blood sugar or Satan, one or the other. <laughs> it was really bad. So there was just no way we could get anything on tape that would have sounded reasonable or was up to our, <clears throat> I'm going to say this, professional standards. So... This is our chance now to do what we were going to do before. Um, our last show was going to be the highlight reel of 2013, the, the stories that George and I thought really were, were kicker stories. And we're going to do that in this segment now. So the, the highlights for 2013, in my mind, are there's a new uh, pope in Rome. There's a new Archbishop of Canterbury in GAFCON II. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's talk first about the new pope in Rome. Um, he is replacing a retiring um, Pope Benedict. He is um, chosen name uh, Pope Francis, and he is a populist Pope. He's very popular, um, but in my mind's eye, he represents the angel trying to find his wings in It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, there's concern. You don't really know what he's going to say, um, and um, you think he's got this giggle going on, and is this the best thing for the Roman Catholic Church at this time? Now, in God's timing and planning, it may be. God may be trying to use th this new pope to draw people back into the church. But from a theological standpoint, when the Roman Catholic Church has been the cornerstone, uh, at least in the last 60, 70 years, of holding theological ground, I, I, I have some worries, George. I am so excited about Pope Francis, and there's so much that he says that resonates with me. From my perspective as an Anglican, as an Episcopalian, when he talks about the corrupting influences of the curia, of the bureaucracy that is stifling the church, I immediately think of Anglicanism, the Anglican Consultative Council, the people in London, the whole system that we have in Anglicanism that seeks is determined to stamp out the spirit and play politics. So when Francis talks about cleaning up the church, I say, yeah, man, go to it, because we need to do it too. Yeah. When he talks about a, a, a service to the poor and the oppressed and the need to raise up people out of poverty, I'm thinking, yeah, go to it, Francis. I agree with you too. But when he backs away from the clarity that was so wonderful about Benedict. That scares me because the problem, from my perspective as an Episcopalian, Francis is not as going to be as helpful a pope as Benedict because he's a little foggy on right and wrong. Well, I think what the the issue is, and it's I call it the Rowan Williams issue. It's the well, this is what he really meant. We never had the uh, ha the the press people have it or the. Uh, press office have to say for John Paul, this is what he really meant. Nobody had to go uh, and, and come and follow a presser with uh, uh, Pope Fr uh, Benedict and say, well, this is what he really meant. Every time uh, Pope Francis is in front of the cameras and does a presser, there's a team of people coming forward and saying, this is what he really meant. Mm -hmm. And we have that problem in the Church of England all the time. We've had it for the last two Archbishops of Canterbury. We have it uh, here in America with uh, um, presiding Bishop Jeffrey Shorey, there's this issue of clarity. And I don't think the current pope provides that. Now, 
God can still use that. Um, George and I are not <laughs> trying to dissuade that this is not God's will. This is George and I just expressing our concern. See, the, the wedge that has been used by the progressive wing, the Episcopal Church, of the last 30 years is the pastoral. We need to be pastoral, and that's why we've had all this change in doctrine and teaching on abortion, homosexuality, uh, all, this, all the daily life issues that people go to. The need to be pastoral, as it's seen by the progressives, outweighs the need to be biblical. Yeah. So at the last general convention, we had a long rigmarole about whether or not we should even require people to be baptized before they receive Holy Communion. Why should we uh, change the rules that have been around for 2,000 years? To be pastoral. Why should we change gay marriage teachings? To be pastoral. And when Francis leads with the pastoral, it empowers the enemies of the Bible and the Episcopal Church and the Anglican Communion to press their agenda as well. And that's what is frightening for me. It's not that Francis is doing anything wrong. It's that the crazies in my own denomination take his lack of clarity as being a license for them to run forward as fast as they can. The next highlight, there was a new Archbishop at Canterbury. His name is Justin Lobby. And I, if you guys watched the show last spring, uh, George and I were playing around with the, the top 10 contenders, top five contenders. Never in any of those um, contenders do we pick Justin Welby to be a front runner, to be the next Archbishop of Canterbury because he was a newbie, brand new to the job, one year as a bishop. Um, yeah, he's got the banking experience and stuff like that, but I don't think he's going to get the call. We thought sure, we had other people on the list. So he gets the call, he becomes the Archbishop of Canterbury. And George and I generally like the guy. He's evangelical. He's from uh, Trinity Brompton. Um, he you know, pretty much understands uh, the gospel the way George and I understand the gospel, as far as we can tell. But he's also bringing a lot of his secular management managerial skills into his role and job, and that is not working so well, George. I had such high expectations for Justin Welby. And just because he's not met my expectations doesn't mean he's done a bad job. Right. It means I've got a screw loose, <laughs> which I think we could all agree upon. Uh -huh. But my impression of Justin Welby is that he's the Velveeta cheese of the Archbishop of Canterbury. He is sort of like this bland, slightly oily thing that is being spread over the communion and try, trying to homogenize and deaden the issues. And that, that analogy may not work for most people, but it does for me. Uh, he's not your brie cheese. <laughs> he's not poignant. He's not spicy. He's not a catalyst for change. He's a catalyst. He's the Indaba Archbishop. Mm -hmm. Let's just keep talking and dull people to the problems in the church. Just get them so exhausted, so bored, and so yeah, 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 that they just go away. Well, it's interesting because we, in the last 30 years, have developed a style of we can solve this by talking. Mm -hmm. um, we believe the liberals that, hey, listen, we'll talk about it. And in the end, there'll be a decision. Well, the problem is there is never in the end. Um, mm -hmm. There's always just talking and talking. And so we get to this point where we've gone through 30 years of talking and listening and in Daba. And we say, okay, can we finally have a decision? And no, the decision is we'll talk longer. That doesn't there's, work. There's this conceit that dialogue, conversation, can change people's minds. Mm -hmm. That's not historically, that's not true. It's just not true. When you're dealing with a revolutionary mindset, um, you are dealing with people who do not have the same basic understanding as to what is right, what is wrong, what, what is proper, what is appropriate. You know. How long did Henry Kissinger dialogue with the North Vietnamese about coming to an equitable, equitable solution for South Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the South Vietnamese uh, didn't want to be North Vietnamese, but the North Vietnamese uh, <laughs> believed that communism was the way forward. Sure. And they will do, and that they had a revolutionary imperative to unite the entire country under a communist regime. And when you have Democrats dealing with uh, totalitarians, there is no negotiation. 
you either win nor lose. You know, Neville Chamberlain really wanted to find peace in our time, but Adolf Hitler didn't want to do it. No, not at all. And we, we find that um, talking is not the an end game like the, the liberals would like it to be because we don't speak a common language. My two plus two equals four is not the same two plus two equals four that is spoken by the leadership of the Episcopal Church. Well, right now within the Episcopal Church, between the liberals and the conservatives, we have, the, the, there is no real dialogue. Mm -hmm. We have, we don't even have interfaith talks. We just, it's either my way or the highway, mm -hmm. or just keep your head down and just hopefully we'll wait it out. Just like the Russians had to wait out 75 years of communism, so do the conservatives will have to wait out 75 years of craziness in the Episcopal Church. Yeah, there's truth to that. A third highlight of 2013 for me and George was GAFCON 2. Now, we've told you before, you can never judge a GAFCON by the conference itself. Um, you have to judge the, the, the GAFCON by what happens after the conference. GAFCON 2, or, or GAFCON 1, was successful because of the Jerusalem Declaration and because of the formation of the Anglican Church in North America. Had those two things had not happened, it would have been a you rah rah session of people worshiping, which is great, but it would not have been the success that the church needed. GAFCON 2, the jury is still out yet because there's a lot of stuff that hasn't happened that's going to happen, we hope. Um, what were the promises of GAFCON 2, George? Well, the public statements, major, major things were the uh, supporting the conservative movement in England, mm -hmm. uh, establishing an ongoing presence of GAFCON, a lot of administrative work, reiteration of the principles of GAFCON 1, but the behind the scenes issues that are not really being spoken about, which have the tendency either to make this a success or a failure, are the women's clergy issue. Uganda may very well have a woman bishop this year. And how can the church, how can GAFCON minister to the conservatives in the Church of England who are leaving over women bishops when GAFCON has women bishops as well. Yeah, and those are one of the things that are, that are playing out here. And um, GAFCON is so far a, a very successful movement, but um, what happens is there's a kind of a, a, a quietness between conferences. And granted, a lot of stuff happens between scenes and we have a whole new slate of primates that were not at GAFCON 1 that are at GAFCON 2. And this is just how things work out internationally now. Um, are they going to have a lot of success in England? Well, we'll have to see. England itself is a mess because of the Archbishop of Canterbury, because of the Conservatives, because of the Liberals, because England itself is post-Christian. Um, and it's a state church thing. That's a, I don't even want to go there. So there's lots of difficulties that they're going to uh, endure. And I don't think that you're going to have the same success you had here in America as you are going to in, in England because there's no common enemy in England. Do you say that the Archbishop of Canterbury is your enemy, like uh, presiding Jeffrey Shorey was the enemy to conservatism here in America? I, can't, I don't think you can make that play. So it's going to have to work out a lot differently in England, and we'll have to see how that works out. That's the highlights of 2013 for Kevin and George. Next segment. Predictions for 2014. George and I are now going to talk about our predictions for 2014. A little disclaimer before we go forward, George and I are nobodies. The only people who make us anybody are you by watching us. We thank you for that, but George and I are good reporters. We're good at breaking stories. We're kind of funny on tape. But we, we don't know the future. We're not really good at predicting what goes on. But what's a 2014 show without predictions of what's going to happen in 2014? So George and I are going to try our best to put on tape what we think will happen this year. And I'm going to start off with, with three things that I think will happen. And these are really great predictions. You're going to say, oh, Kevin, where did you come up with these? First, I predict the liberal church will still decline in its membership. Yeah, I do. I also uh, predict that the atheist church, that new atheist mega church in, in Europe and, and starting here in America, will fall apart and uh, um, disappear completely. Sadly, I also predict a large portion of Christians in the Middle East will either have to move, be slaughtered, or persecuted. 
and the persecution is currently going on, the move is currently going on, and uh, the pushing them out is currently going on. So that's kind of a prediction in action. George, what are your predictions? I believe that the conservative movement within, within Anglicanism will continue to be divided. Mm -hmm. The divisions between ACNA and the conservatives in the Episcopal Church, the divisions between the GAFCON movement and the Global South movement, they're not going to be healed. Mm -hmm. We're going to still have disparate groups, each putting their own uh, model of uh, action forward. And a, year, and a year from now, we're not going to see any, any movement in that school. I see the battle in Africa heating up, the church battle in Africa, sure. the, uh, the fight, and it'll probably result in a few schisms, maybe one, maybe two, I see potential. Uh, money's being poured into uh, pliable bishops, death, uh, deathly situations, and in return, uh, uh, the Episcopal Church is asking for pass. And they're going to get it from some African provinces. And my third and final prediction is that the Episcopal Church is going to gear up for its next presiding bishop and is going to try to step back from the brink politically, but go forward with gay marriages and gay blessings and a new prayer book. They're going to try to have it both ways. And they'll probably pick somebody in 2015 who will be smooth enough to make it happen. Somebody whom Justin Welby can work with. Which is sad because what we're predicting is the inevitable will still be the inevitable. Um, you know, th the reality is with George's prediction about the new uh, presiding bishop here in America is that's one of the serious concerns that could really happen is having a moderate presiding bishop follow up Shorey who sits down and gets cozy cozy with the Archbishop of Canterbury and really separates itself from any GAFCON and any um, and the Church of North America. That could be a problem. And, you know, the, the greatest gift to the ACNA and to GAFCON was presiding Bishop Jeffrey Shorey. You just know it the other way around it, George. Yeah, we're going to get... Uh, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey has been a disaster on many, many levels. Mm -hmm. uh, but most especially, she's been a disaster on a PR level. She just is... is a joke. <laughs> but she's been a she's been a good joke for people like you and me because it gives us plenty to write about, plenty to talk about, and the Episcopal Church is smart enough to find somebody who believes the exact same things that she does, but is very good at being sweet and loving and kind and accommodating. And there are bishops out there, new bishops in the last four or five years, who fill all those who who are ideologically pure from a liberal perspective, but kind and loving and sweet and savvy. And it's the sort of thing where I, Justin Welby says, I can sit down and talk with this guy for the next five years till I retire. And remember, or we're going to get somebody like John Allen. Now, in the Episcopal Church, John Allen was the presiding bishop who said, I'm against women bishops personally, but I'm not going to stand in the way, let my uh, view drive things. Mm -hmm. Well, we may get a conservative who will say, well, I really am not in favor of gay marriage, but I won't stand in the way for those people who want to have it. And so the ideologues who demand that either you conform to heresy or get out of the Episcopal Church, they're going to continue on the local level, and you'll have a weak national leader, or you'll have a smooth national leader who's going to facilitate this, but withdraw the sting from overseas opprobrium. Now, you talked about Africa, and I talked about the Middle East. It's so easy for the Episcopal Church to have monetary influence in Africa um, f for very little change. Uh, a few shillings does a lot more than the millions of dollars they're spending on uh, trying to retain churches and dioceses here in America. Um, it, you know, we talked last year about what was happening in Tanzania. We talked recently about what was happening in uh, Central Africa. It doesn't take a lot of money to... Now, the Africans aren't changing their mind on what's going on and what they believe, but they're going to give the Episcopal Church what we call a pass. Yeah. Well, what happened, What we're going to see, and we've seen this in the past, we'll see it in the future, is the Episcopal Church is going to play on tribalism to destabilize mm -hmm. well, Kenya. Yeah. We had some Kenyan bishops who went to the uh, 2008 Lambeth Conference, and they were from Western Kenya, and they were from a tribal minority that's always been sort of on the outs with the Kenya Nairobi crowd. 
Now, we're, and money is sent to those guys and they're supported. And these outliers in, in solid provinces like Kenya and Uganda, there are bishops there who'll take money because they're a minority tribe or a minority faction. Or places like the Sudan that is so deathly poor and so dysfunctional and so broken up and is now in the midst of a tribal civil war, bishops will take any help they can get. And so they'll gladly give people a pass what they do in the U.S. in return for $20,000. Mm. We're going to see that continue, and we're going to see pressure being placed on these marginal African provinces to give the Episcopal Church a pass. We're going to see that pick up this year very strongly. And I predicted the, the continued slaughter in uh, the Middle East. That's, you know, <laughs> the longest human conflict we, we have on record is uh, between Israel and uh, and. Uh, their, their enemies. And that still happens now between Christian and the enemies. And um, there's not, not, no longer a place of peace once we threw, threw the tyrants out. And uh, the, the civil war is going to take care of the, the rest of Christianity um, in the Middle East is, is I can see it, George. Yeah, the uh, situation is going to get worse in Syria. It's going to get worse in Iraq. The two safest places for Christians in the Middle East these days are Iran and Israel. What does that tell you? Uh, it's going to get much worse in Egypt. The army is going to crack down on all religious dis religious issues. Mm -hmm. And when things get hot, what do they do in the past? What they did in the past is what they'll do in the future. Blame the Christians. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not as going to be as immediately bad as it was under the Muslim Brotherhood, but it's going to get there. And Israel, oddly enough, and against all of the nonsense we hear out of the Church of England and some other denominations of being the reason for the decimation of Christians in the Middle East, Israel is going to see an influx of Christians from the region. And people just don't seem to get that that that's a safe haven. I'll be there tomorrow by 4 p.m. A special guest to Anglican Unscripted this week is Archbishop Robert Duncan, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, um, his recent College of Bishops meeting in Florida. Um, I would hate to say he did not go down there for warm weather. It was uh, rather uh, cool down there, I understand. It was, uh, it, yes, it was nothing like what it was in the rest of the country, but it was mighty cold on Tuesday. Uh, and uh, I think the bishops were glad to be there, but um, it, it, was, it, it was unusual for Florida. We had almost all the bishops come together. Uh, in the end, there were only two who were prevented uh, by just so many cancellations of planes and, 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 and couldn't finally join us. Now, the, the, the College of Bishops have been meeting every six months since the formation of the ACNA, and you've, you've covered lots of important topics. And we read in your communique that um, you're continuing the, the study of uh, um, uh, the future of women's ordination in, in the church. How's that study going? The uh, Theological Task Force on Holy Wars is doing a wonderful work for us. Okay. Uh, very shortly, uh, we ought to be able to release for everybody uh, the hermeneutical principles. Um, they may have already been been uh, released since since last week, mm -hmm. together with a report on the process. There was a five stage process that was agreed to, and the second stage was to look at how uh, Anglicans have always decided things uh, based on on scripture, on the interpretation of scripture, on hermeneutics, uh, both uh, directly from uh, from the scriptures, uh, the, the Reformation um, uh, period in terms of how it dealt with interpretation of scriptures and just our long history in, in that regard. And I think uh, while this was done uh, in order to help us to be clear as we think about uh, women in holy orders, um, this is going to be a marvelous tool for Anglicans everywhere. Mm -hmm. Now, we also discussing something brand new, a new catechesis was, yes. uh, was uh, introduced. And um, first tell me the importance of having a catechesis in the church, because in my Episcopalian background, I don't have a, a, a much remember, memory of a catechesis. 
Well, the, the, the 21st century, you know, is a post-Christian century, mm -hmm. at least in North America. Uh, and uh, um, the world that uh, uh, earlier prayer books addressed, a very much a Christian world, were now faced with, uh, uh, with a world that has no idea about who Jesus is, or about our triune God, uh, about what it all means. And uh, what the college actually did two and a half years ago in our first discussion meeting, which took place in September of 2010, um, we actually met with our catechesis task force, which had begun to look at all these issues. How do we teach? What's, what do we teach? Uh, and the bishop said simply to the task force, Bring us a catechism. That's what we need, and we need a catechism for the uh, for the modern world or the postmodern world. We need a catechism uh, that actually would enable somebody to understand the whole Christian faith. So, what we received last week, uh, and we've been back and forth in the College of Bishops with the Catechesis Task Force um, over our last several meetings was a, a document that has 345 questions and answers um, that actually begins uh, with um, the, the, the question of how would you lead somebody to Christ. And it's a fascinating, it's fascinating work. Again, it should be available to the whole church within a week. It's just a matter of the final kind of editorial uh, matters, like to use the the, the preposition uh, with or among, <laughs> those kinds of things. Uh, we've been blessed to have uh, Jim Packer as a chief arch arch architect on this, but we've had everybody from all three streams. Uh, it's, it's very much a, a unifying document, uh, very much a document that attempts to, to to speak for the whole church. Um, it's organized in the way classic catechisms are organized around uh, the three great um, uh, teachings that uh, uh, the Christians always had to, to know when they came to confirmation um, or in an earlier age to baptism, the Apostles' Creed, uh, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments. Again, um, uh, how do you, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the Apostles' Creed, what do we believe? The Lord's Prayer, uh, how do we live um, in the Spirit? How do we live uh, a life in response to, 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 uh, um, to, to the God we know um, in terms of uh, our, our life of prayer um, and worship um, and uh, uh, our relationship to the Lord, but then how do we live in, in the world, uh, in the moral order? So I think this, this document is going to be a, a huge um, tool for us and actually, I think it's going to be something that uh, folks throughout the world um, uh, use. Um, we've already been told, we were told actually that in an earlier draft, they all say, you know, not for publication. <laughs> <It doesn't work. laughs> we, had, we, had one of the, we had one of the bishops of, of uh, uh, the, the, the Arab world with us um, uh, both last time and this time. And last time, uh, uh, Bishop Marshall sort of asked privately and said, well, could I just take it back and maybe tra get it translated into Urdu and Farsi? Because it would be so helpful to to us in Iran. Oh, definitely, yes. Okay. Uh, and so we know it's already been translated into Chinese and into Spanish. Um, we think it's going to be a, a tool that the whole Anglican world uh, finds um, a, an absolute uh, contemporary blessing. Now, there's been a lot of success in the ACNA in 2013. One of the highlights I saw was uh, you, you're slowly putting together a prayer book. Uh, and we saw the Eucharist. Um, wh what do you find in that success? Well, again, what we've been trying to do is to uh, bring the, the, the heart the, the, uh, of the Anglican, um, traditionally Anglican way of prayer uh, into the 21st century. Uh, again, there are many um, turns of phrase that really have shaped us uh, and the the texts for common prayer really take um, the tradition um, and claim it. 
um, and, and do it in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that's appropriate. Well, one of my favorite things is, is just right up front uh, in the text for common prayer in the, in the daily offices. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the revisions of the late 20th century, um, the sense was that we needed to drop the phrase, and there is no health in us. Um, what this book does, realizing the importance of that declaration in terms of who we are as sinners, uh, it, it inserts the phrase, and apart from your grace, there is no health in us, which is utterly true, solves the problem, but doesn't actually get rid of the fundamental assertion. So again, you'll find that over and over and over again in the work that was done. In the suffrages at, at morning and evening prayer, um, we pray, um, uh, O Lord, save our nations. Uh, what's wonderful about, again, that, that ra rather than save the state or um, save our nation uh, is that the recognition that, of course, we're a province of two nations, but in almost every context, wherever we worship, we have people from multiple nations. So when we're gathered for a corporate office, we're always praying uh, for the nations that are there represented. And so, again, some wonderful things that are utterly in the prayer book tradition. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I think the, the church is finding uh, useful. We, we did make one, we bishops did realize we made one terrible mistake in, in putting forward the, t the text for common prayer. We called one the long form and one the short form. <laughs> and that was to condemn the long form <laughs> to, to much lack use. And we realized that. <laughs> the short form is is an adequate offering, but um, as as we bishop shared notes this time, we realized that everybody was using the short form, and uh, mm -hmm. the long form was going to have a, diff a difficult uh, sleigh ride. <laughs> Not going to make it to print. Now, 2014 is going to be your year of retirement. Uh, in June, you step aside, yes. and there's a new archbishop uh, yes. to be chosen. Um, everybody's asking, what is the process for choosing a new Archbishop of Canterbury? Are we going to do the Bartholomew uh, roll the dice, or do we have a plan? We do have a plan. Good. We have a clear plan. Good. Again, uh, back in the very, at the very beginning of our life together as a province, uh, in the college, I appointed a, uh, a task force to look at how we would choose the next Archbishop. And they brought their report to that meeting in Sumas, Washington uh, in 2010, and we looked at it, and it, it looked very much like the processes we'd known in most of the churches out of which the Anglican Church in North America had been developed. That is what it can only be described as a, as a process with, with candidates and nominees and discussions and uh, all of that, we realized when we received that report that that was not what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. That if we did things the same way we had done them before, we would likely get the same result. And that what would come to um, dominate the process of selecting the next archbishop would be issues. Um, rather than the question of uh, the, the spiritual qualities and a person who could lead um, uh, it, all of us uh, into the next, um, uh, next period of our life. Um, so what, uh, what has emerged and what the college finally approved uh, when we were together last week um, is essentially a, a, a conclave. Mm -hmm. um, all of the bishops will come together uh, on uh, uh, a Thursday evening preceding uh, our assembly a week before. Uh, we'll meet in a monastic setting. Uh, we'll uh, have a conference and talk together about what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. We'll take a first ballot on Friday morning uh, in which the question I will place before the college is, who in this college do you individually believe could best lead this church for the next five years. And everybody will be free to write on a slip of paper the name of any bishop in the college. Mm -hmm. We'll receive that result and we'll talk together. It, it, it'll be a fascinating 
uh, uh, exercise because, of course, it, there's, anybody's name could be written at least anybody within the college. Uh, we'll talk about that, we'll confer about that, we'll draw aside uh, and have the opportunity for prayer and walks, and talks in no more than two or three, not a political, you know, gathering of forces related to, and then in the afternoon we'll take another ballot. Uh, when we come together we'll see what the Lord has said since the morning uh, to individuals. We'll. Uh, see what uh, bishops are moved to say. We'll take another ballot, aware of what the first ballot did, and uh, uh, we'll see how that comes out. And then we'll talk together about it. We may at that point uh, want to ask uh, those whose names are emerging to, to say some things to us. Um, this is very much uh, the, the process, in fact, that's, that's used in the Vatican uh, for the election of a bishop of Rome. Um, while we, um, we have many differences from that system in terms of the ecclesiology of our church, uh, their pattern of electing has tended to do better than our pattern. Well, I, I gotta say from a video standpoint, I would appreciate black and white smoke indicators. <laughs> <laughs> well, since we'll be at a, 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 a Catholic uh, abbey, I'm sure we can arrange for that. As someone suggested that it might be clearer to use one of the flagpoles and put up either a black or white flag. <laughs> but in, in any case, we'll do that um, uh, for Friday, Saturday, into Sunday with the, our Sunday Eucharist together. Every day will begin with, with Eucharist. Um, if we're trusting that by Monday it'll be clear who the next archbishop um, should be, it requires two-thirds uh, votes according to our um, our constitution canons, um, and we'll 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 announce that immediately, just as as uh, um, you'd expect in, a, in in an open time. Now your time is valuable today. You're you're going to another uh, dentist appointment. Uh, you've had some health issues um, that people need to be aware of and pray about. Um. Sure. Yeah, well, uh, the, 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 we're, we're about to have root canal number seven mm. uh, since Nairobi. Um, you know, if any, uh, the, the, the leading a church can be painful. <laughs> <laughs> leading this church has really not been too painful. I mean, we, we again, we 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 really had, uh, there's a splendid spirit in the in the College of Bishops. But I think what the Lord is doing, as I understand what's happened, uh, really at Nairobi and since Nairobi, uh, I had said very clearly to the church that I believed my leadership, which has extended actually. Uh, since long before the Anglican Church in North America was was founded, it, that this one term for me w was was the right thing for me to do, and right for me, in the best interest of the church, to hand it over to others. The health issues, I think, actually um, uh, being taken sick in Nairobi, uh, uh, did, did did two things. Uh, first, it confirmed the fact that the Anglican Church in North America was alive and well, Absolutely. healthy, and it could do just fine without me, mm -hmm. which was a wonderful blessing to me and to others. But secondly, I think it also confirmed for everybody that I was right in saying only one term as, as Archbishop. I mean, I had a six-year term as moderator of Common Cause and had been in leadership for a long time. So um, uh, I think the health issues, I'm, I'm really talking about what I think they mean as opposed to the issues themselves. I'll take all the prayer I can get. Uh, it turns out that, that some folks know that I uh, suffer from type 2 diabetes. I, I'm able to medicate for that. I don't need to to, um, to use insulin at this point. Um, but what, what has been explained to me is two things. One, um, that the, the roots of uh, or the, the nerves in my teeth uh, are probably not getting enough blood and therefore dying. Mm -hmm. um, and that when we travel, when we do this 30,000 foot stuff, um, the, any abscess in the gums uh, really just gets liberated. And that's what happened as I went to Nairobi. Um, and uh, uh, that's why we're having these root canals, because I get on a plane for Rwanda and Uganda on Wednesday, 
<laughs> but we think that there's no more abscesses and no more roots to die. Yeah. So again, I'm, I'm in generally good health. I look. I, I, some of the viewers would know that I'm going to. Uh, I've been asked to return to the Diocese of Pittsburgh as their diocesan for a couple of years. Uh, the standing committee is clear. We want to have a, a time of uh, of, uh, of sabbatical. Uh, after July, and I'll have several months of that. Oh, great. Oh, that's good to hear. Uh, uh, but I'm going to go back to being the diocesan bishop, which the, the Pittsburgh has been incredibly generous. And uh, so I'm going to I'm going to give some some of my time to them. One final question before you go. Um, yeah. Now, you have had several challenges uh, put before you as archbishop, and you were oh, mm -hmm. you were able to overcome all of them. What do you think is going to be the biggest challenge for the next archbishop in North America? Uh, the, 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 the greatest challenge has been um, uh, the reformation of behavior. Uh, David Short called it that in meditations he gave to us back in the Common Cause days. Right. Apostles needed to look like apostles and needed to behave like apostles. And we've worked very hard on that. Um, but you know the old uh, saying, under stress, regress. I mean, I think we're in a very good place. I think that the, the, the church will continue in a very good place. Um, but we can always fall back. The temptation to talk about one another rather than to one another. Mm -hmm. The temptation to resort to, you know, kind of political, let, let's get several folks together and get some steam behind this, rather than talking to the person who's archbishop or, you know, to, to the right place. Send, Those, send them a letter instead of calling them? Yes. Those are all things we know. Yeah. Uh, those are all things we've really headed into, into a college of bishops, and this church should be very proud of its college of bishops. The, the reality is that the church will, will reflect the apostles it has. So the greatest challenge, in fact, is going to be to keep us um, uh, as, as godly men serving the church, uh, as, as those who really are living uh, in a way that, um, that commends itself to the church and looks like the New Testament. I think that's the great challenge. The secondary challenge, and it's one I work very hard on, and I think we've got a lot of things in place, is the, is the full integration of the province mm -hmm. from what was once a federation to uh, a really vibrant um, uh, and, 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 and united church. You'll remember our vision was, uh, was biblical, missionary, and united, and we've made lots of strides on all of those, on all of those grounds. But uh, again, the overlapping jurisdictions, we're working away at that. There's no question the trajectory is more and more toward geographical um, uh, 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 diocese bishops are in many cases commending congregations that are outliers to other bishops. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, the, the next, the next, the next archbishop will have his challenges, things we can't predict. Uh, but I'd say those things, um, which are in a very good uh, place and moving in in a very right direction, um, uh, I think he he will work at those things, and those will bless the church. As we close the interview, we have six months now until uh, your meeting at St. Vincent's in Pennsylvania. What would you charge Anglican Unscripted uh, viewers to pray for in that, in that time? Well, uh, pray for the continued unity of the church, mm -hmm. pray for the continued mission of the church, uh, pray that we be faithful to the Word of God, uh, pray that the new catechism will, will, that will develop the kind of systems around that. Um, now, we focused in the first five years on planting churches, and we've been wonderfully successful at that. There's still more to do. As uh, Alan Hawkins said, we're, we're just about the first thousand right now, just the first thousand. But the next thing is to go deep on discipling, yes. pray that that can happen, um, and, and pray for the emergence of God's choice for the next archbishop. Um, many say I was, you know, God's choice for this period. Um, I think that's true. I say that humbly. Uh, I just pray that the church will have God's choice for the next uh, period, no matter who that is, um, uh, and that we just listen to the Lord. Um, so those those are those are my prayers and my commending to 
to, to viewers and listeners um, as we go through these next six months. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll be, I'll obviously be praying for you as you're in your dentist chair today. And uh, you and I are both leaving the country this week. Uh, God, Godspeed, my friend. God bless you and uh, God bless everybody. Well, it's a brand new year, and a brand new year in the Episcopal Church means no more lawsuits, or going to court, or suing yourself, of all things. Uh, Alan Haley and I are going to talk a little about South Carolina. The news last week was the federal uh, courts ruled that the insurance company for the Episcopal Church has to pay the fees for the Loyalist group. And, Correct. And I'm trying to figure out how this works, that you sue yourself and wh where was the writer in this policy that did not prevent this from happening? <laughs> right, well, okay, let's sketch the parties first. Okay. We have the, Epis the Episcopal Diocese, uh, rather, no, not the Episcopal Diocese, yeah. the Episcopal Church right. in South Carolina, uh -huh. the Rump Group, under Bishop von Rosenberg. And they have an insurance policy with the church insurance company. And the church insurance company is an arm of the church pension fund. Yes, in yes. other words, mm -hmm. one of the ways the pension fund makes money uh, to on its the money that's been given it for pay for retirement benefits is by investing it out in this insurance company that collects premiums for and hopefully doesn't have to pay too much out in coverage. Well, that changed in South Carolina last week because uh, what happened, of course, was Bishop von Rosenberg and his rump group they started off right off the bat by using the name and seal of the Episcopal Diocese of South Carolina, Mark Lawrence's diocese. And they, you know, used the email format of the messages. They just took the appropriate, misappropriated the identity of the, Mark Lawrence and his diocese and just began pretending as though they were, they were he. And so um, Mark Lawrence and his diocese went to court, as they were forced to, to stop them from misrepresenting themselves as who they were not. And they got the injunction. And then, lo and behold, Bishop von Roseberg and his group they ran to their insurance company and said, now, wait a minute, we've been sued here, and there's a part of our policy. Everyone who has a general liability policy for his business or organization, there's a clause in there that covers in injury that you do to competition or trademark mm -hmm. rights of Absolutely. other people. And so they claimed that now they're being sued for trademark infringement. Well, of course they infringed trademark. They went over and deliberately started using all the signs of the bishop and the diocese of South Carolina. And so <laughs> then naturally they got sued. But anyway, they, they told the insurance company, well, we've been sued and we've got this policy that says you have to defend us. And the insurance company said, not so fast. We've got a writer on that that we wrote uh, when you took the policy out that excludes all this church inter-entity litigation between entities claiming uh, who is the real bishop of what's from a call it, whatever. Sure. And so they said that writer would um, prevent us from having to defend this case because this is one of those cases. Well, this is and they the, said, the, the insurance is really for if grandma slips on the sidewalk. Correct. Uh, or if there's, you know, other types of lawsuits of injury or uh, liability, it, right. or in, in this case, trademark, it's not for suing yourself. Yeah, and it's also spot, not supposed to be for intentional conduct. Right. So I, I don't know how the, I mean, the insurance company may have a re reservation there still effective. Uh, I don't know any about this or not, but normally if you go out and whap somebody over the head and assault them, you can't claim your liability policy to go defend you. Uh, for negligence or something like that. It was intentional. And so, it, anyway, leave that be. The second right, uh, defense the insurance company had was that um, they were, were being sued for damages. Uh, there was no money claimed against them by Bishop Lawrence. Just please stop using the trademark of our diocese. And uh, as the answer to that was, well, no, we're actually being sued for attorney's fees because the loser is going to have to pay attorney's fees. And the court bought that argument and said, yeah, that's damages. And it also said the writer was not specific enough to uh, prevent the general coverage provided by the policy for advertising injury it's, uh, to kick in. It's very interesting. The Episcopal Church is really providing an education here. It, underwriters it now are going to take what's called the Episcopal class in underwriting. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, not only that, but I mean, if you think about what's happening here, you have a group of clergy and the bishop uh, and a bishop in South Carolina. They are suing their own pension fund, in effect, um, and taking money from that pension fund reserves, which it had set aside for the insurance company, to pay for the litigation costs that they for the fight that they started in South Carolina. So this is an example to me of how the Episcopal Church is losing it in these latter days. It is losing sight and all perspective of what's going on in the simple, uh, single-minded idea that they have to fight every person who disagrees with them. And that is unfortunate. It is. Right now you're recording from North, uh, Cal Northern California. Uh, Correct. And I, in, in a few minutes, you've been generous with your time. You're going to hop in a car and drive down to... Uh, the southern Fres part Fresno. Of, uh, right. of California. Uh, you're involved in the trial in, in the Diocese of San Joaquin. We don't want to talk about too much about that. Um, but people are going, well, what's going on? Well, you're in the middle of the trial. Exactly. We have probably one more day of court trial mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow, and then the judge will take it under advisement. There'll be some briefing from both sides, and it'll be kind of like the way Quincy went uh, We'll have to wait a while for the court to issue its decision. Well, it's a decision. Uh, that's, about the, there's also the the war of paperwork. Exactly. Know, and uh, he wants a, a you know 50 pages from you, 50 pages from them, and then they, he'll he'll re, reissue a call for more uh, documentation. And right. you know this can take six months, a year, or longer before and, he's satisfied that he has enough material before him to make a decision. And tens and tens of thousands of dollars, and, right? Yes, and, and money up the wazoo, which the pension fund's not going to pay for this one. Now, no. <laughs> in the future, is this a strategy that uh, uh, we can use to uh, sue and have our court <laughs> cases paid for by uh, church insurance? <laughs> as far as I know, church insurance doesn't write insurance for non-Episcopal churches. So <laughs> we're, we're on our own out there. But as I say, they're cannibalizing themselves in this case and just um, eating their own. So it, it's kind of, um, it's, in, in a sense, it's, it's gruesomely fascinating to watch. It is. <laughs> I want people to pray for your safe travel and uh, pray for your court this week. And uh, we'll probably have an update hopefully next week. Uh, I'll be in Jerusalem, but I'm still going to try and film oh, uh, uh, overseas. What's the difference? It's seven hours here. It'll be, it'll be a 12 hour difference between uh, Alan and I. It'll be a fun taping. See well, and, uh, <laughs> you go to Jerusalem. Next week, I go to South Carolina. That's interesting. <laughs> okay. So it'll be seven hours. That's not too bad. <laughs> next week, Alan. Okay. All right, we're closing out the first episode of 2014 where you got to listen to George and Kevin talk about 2013. We talked about the highlights. And we do this because it's a chance for us to give God thanks for all he's done for us as a church, as a people. We, George and I pray that you've had an opportunity in the last year to draw closer to God, that every day your walk with him grows closer. And we talk about predictions of 2014 in that same light, that it gives you an opportunity to, to pray for the church. 2014 is not going to be a great year for the church because there is going to be persecution. There's going to be corruption. There's going to be things that happen around the world that are going to affect brothers and sisters of Christ. And we as Christians pray about those, and we pray about other people's needs. And we also pray that all these events God could use to draw them closer to Him. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of this life. It's the way it works. You got to also watch a wonderful interview with Archbishop Robert Duncan. He was very open in talking about um, the, the selection of a new archbishop and um, his time in office and, and the meeting at the uh, College of Bishops in Florida, which uh, you clearly understand with this latest polar vortex was not a warm time, so, but it was a fun time. George and I want to really thank you for watching us the last year in 2013, and we hope to grow the audience in, in 2014. And I have a new program I'm introducing. Uh, in 2014. It's called the Anglican TV Logo Program. If you put the Anglican TV logo on your church website and you send me a link, in the closing show notes you'll find your church website listed. For the first week you put it up, I can't keep listing it. So it's uh, my way of spreading the news of Anglican Unscripted. Also, we're having a selfie contest. Anybody crazy enough to take a selfie, here we go, of yourself with us in the background, 
we might post those pictures too and have a best selfie of our selfie pictures. So fun stuff at Anglican Unscripted. George? <laughs> you, you know, Kevin, That's the Archbishop, Archbishop of Sydney's uh, Glenn Davies gave his Christmas sermon on the sinfulness of selfies. What? So we may be losing our, our Sydney audience with that one, but <laughs> I, hey, we'll give it a shot. I expect an Aussie will win. <laughs> That's it for Anglican Unscripted. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 89 of Anglican Unscript. Four buttons are on. Everything looks good for now. <laughs> it took me, I finally had to reboot a set. All I had to do was reboot a monitor for the sound thing to work. I said right. Oh, <laughs> well, good. Yeah, I know. So it's, it's the last thing I tried. I was just at a wit's end. I'm like, you know, I paid all this money for a system where I could do live recording, right? You know, two side by side, no editing, and it stopped working and, one day. And of course, every week, every day down there in the courthouse, you have to go through the security line. Yeah, and attorneys are supposed to show their bar card in order to get through the line oh, sure. quicker and yeah. easier. And I scrambled the first day. I was carrying all of my briefcases and files and everything. I couldn't find the damn bar card. I couldn't find it. I finally found a little uh, Hertz Carl card or something that they give so you can get a rate on Hertz. And I showed that, and that got me through. And that got me through the couple of days. And then they questioned finally, what kind of bar card is that? <laughs> so I've been looking all weekend for my real bar card. And, of course, it was in my wallet the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. Ah, the craziness. Okay, so yep. we are recording. We're good to go. Three, two, one.